Right. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us for this session this afternoon. Um, my name is Harriet Wenberg, and I'm Executive Director of, of INTBAU. Um, and for those of you who don't, don't know it so well, we're a um, membership-based network, um, and uh, it's globally based. We've got chapters in 35 countries around the world, um, completely free to, to join through our website, which is intbau.org. So, do yeah, do check out the website and join if you haven't already to find out about more talks coming up. This is a, a materials focused, um, so materials in focus session. Um, and we're really pleased to have with us Andrew Evans um, to speak about the Caboge project. Um, Andrew, just very briefly to introduce him, uh, is an architectural assistant at Hudson Architects. He gained his part one and part two at the Glasgow School of Art before going on to graduate first in his class with an MSc in environmental architecture in 2018. Um, Andrew is a published researcher with knowledge of many aspects of sustainable design and he has a particular interest in healthy buildings and occupant comfort. Um, so just to say very briefly how the how the session is going to work, we're going to hand over and, and hear from Andrew and then in terms of questions at the end, um, anyone who's on, who's on this Zoom session um, can feel very free either to type your question into the chat at the bottom of the screen as we go um, or just to put your hand up when we come to questions at the end and we'll then just come to each in turn and ask you to, to, to unmute and, and ask your question directly yourself. Um, and for anybody who's watching on Facebook, just obviously type your question in and um, my colleague Jules, um, who's in Bowers Programme and Communications Coordinator, will pick up your question and put it to Andrew from there. Um, so hopefully a very good discussion to follow, but without further ado, thanks again, everyone for joining and Andrew, over, over to you. Great. Well, um, thanks everyone. Uh, I will share my uh, my first slide here, and we can get going. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. I mean that I'm not just sitting here talking to Jules and uh, Harriet. So thank you for the introduction as well. Um, I am Andrew Evans, uh, and I work at Hudson Architects. Um, we are one of the partners uh, on the Caboge project. Sorry, I just can't see my slides because of the Zoom. Um, along with um, several partners both in the UK and uh, in France, so this is a cross-channel and um, EU funded, interreg funded uh, project um, and the whole project stems from that massive problem that we're all having with climate change and the EU has huge ambitions about cutting its, uh, its um, greenhouse, grass, uh, greenhouse gases based on 1990 levels and obviously these keep on increasing um, even as December last year They've kind of pushed up the 2030 target so these things are really creeping up on us it's 2021 already and we don't know if we're making that much headway uh, so the project funding i have to obviously mention interreg thanks interreg for all the money and um, it's really nice um and this money is being spent um on developing a new type of super low embodied energy construction um and this is our list of partners. Um, everyone brings something different to the group. Um, it's a really great collaborative group of us and you can see us all based in the interreg area there. Um, and the, the, the research is, it's already going places, we've already won awards. This piece of um, research is actually Caboge 2. So Caboge 1 originally won a grant to develop the material that I'm going to talk about and we're now at the point where we're developing it further to become a workable, uh, usable material and actually build something out of it. So there's the creating the good of the Caboche project and um, get, get to go over and get an award. Meanwhile, I stayed home. Um, and we know this is happening um, before COVID. If you can remember that far back, everyone was getting quite worried about the environment. Everyone was declaring climate emergencies. It was really gathering, I think, a kind of positive head of steam and then hopefully it will get back to that once we all get back to real life, whatever that may be. Um, but the thing that Caboge needs to address is embodied energy. And I think we've been really good at measuring and reducing the operational energy of buildings. Uh, and buildings use about 40% of the world's energy and produce about 40% of the world's CO2 as a ballpark figure. And we really need to get that down. And we're getting there. Things like better windows, more insulation, we've got more efficient appliances. So that energy that's used in a building day to day, it's coming down. 
But what's not changing is the energy we use to build a building that embodied energy. And it's becoming a bigger and bigger chunk of what we're building. So it's the next thing that needs to get done. Um, and if you look at this, um, these graphs, um, you don't need to pay too much attention, but if you look at the dark purple sectors, that's the potential uh, embodied energy of different sectors of buildings. So you can see residential and you know, a, a really well-built residential building, it can be as much as 50% of the 60 year life cycle assessment of CO2. So it's something that really needs to be sorted. Um, so uh, Caboj, it's earth. Simple material, you know, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, we've been building with it for quite a long time uh, in a widespread way. And there's lots of reasons that we build with it, not just because it's convenient, but it's recyclable. It's got really high thermal mass, so it stays cool in summer and it will stay warm in winter. Um, and 2021 in the UK, it's fireproof. Um, I think fortunately we're um, looking really seriously at fire risk these days, um, unfortunately, you know, it took something terrible for that to happen, but you know, it's happening. Um, it's, it controls moisture, it absorbs VOCs, it's got great acoustic performance. There's all sorts of reasons to build with earth and not just in Caboj, but you can buy off the shelf earth blocks if you're someone who's specifying internal walls. Earth blocks are an ideal thing because they're resilient, they're strong, they keep out the noise, um, lots of reasons to have earth in your building. And earth is not new, obviously. Um, but it's much older than you might even think. Um, and buildings um, in Yemen, like here, have been standing for, I mean, almost a thousand years. I mean, if you were 900, I don't think anyone would be annoyed if you rounded it up to a thousand. But, um, and this is resilient, repairable material that can withstand the test of time and the test of humans. And Earth is everywhere. Um, this is a kind of tie-in of uh, areas of Earth building and UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So it's pretty much wherever you see people and even vaguely the right climate to build an earth, there's earth buildings. Um, and obviously here in the UK, which is where I'm based, we have our own uh, traditions of earth building. Um, so even in a kind of small group of islands, we have all these different traditions. So um, there's a lot of knowledge to draw upon in earth building. So uh, this is the interreg area and we're trying to draw upon as much as we can from our own area. Um, in East Anglia, surprisingly, it's it's adobe, it's earth block, so um, just air dried mud blocks. Um, you know, and you, you might think these houses, well, if it's made out of earth, it might have a bit of a hobbit housey look, but this is kind of in Norfolk. This is a, a normal house made out of earth blocks, and I don't think you'd really know unless you knew. And I think that's definitely something we're looking at for Caboj. We don't want this material we're developing to dictate how things were going to look. Uh, and then obviously in the West Country here, um, we've got cob and cob looks like cob and they're very pretty, um, usually thatched roofs with stone plinths at the bottom. Um, but again, that's um, the, the aesthetic is, is not what we're drawing from here. It's the technology and how these things are built. They're completely monolithic, incredibly strong, really resilient. Um, and then, our partners in France. So it's in, in France, Cobb is, is Bauge, hence Cobb Bauge. And it's built in a very similar way. Cobb in the West Country, except in France, it's a lot nicer weather there. So they don't have to cover it with render. It doesn't need as much protection. And actually these bare earth walls um, are fairly commonplace in, are in Normandy, the way that you'd expect to see Cobb buildings um, in the West Country. So Cobbauge, I've kind of alluded, but what actually is it? Well, it's not new, kind of. Um, this the structure of the building is the same monolithic cob that you know a normal cob building is made out of. Um, it's just normal earth um, that you'd expect a cob builder to, to be making. And what really makes Caboge different is it's um, it's first of all shuttered, which I'll show you. Um, and the walls are the, the cob is much thinner than you'd expect a cob wall to be. And normally you'd expect it to be, you know, a few feet thick and to be quite strong. And the overall buildup of Caboj is uh, two feet at 600 millimeters. But half of that is insulating cob. And it's it's actually, although it looks incredibly different, it's actually just the same stuff in a different ratio. So you just put in more of that kind of fiber, that straw, that hemp, that flax, that reed that you would put in. 
and this um, high amount of, um, of this material, I mean, reed is a, a natural insulator anyway, but it creates an insulation layer that works homogeneously completely with the structural cob and it becomes this kind of strong monolithic thing. And the two layers actually bond together uh, in a really strong way. Uh, and it means that we have this wonderful thermal mass, all these advantages of earth and also insulation, because right now you can't build with cob. Um, it just doesn't meet the insulation values in the UK or France or in almost all developed countries. Um, so there's been a lot of testing to figure out how to make insulation out of mud, as you can imagine. Usually you stand in a puddle of mud, it's not the warmest thing. So we've tested all sorts of different materials at Plymouth University um, and ESTIC in France. Uh, there's been a huge, huge backlog of testing, and this goes back to Capoge 1 that I talked about earlier, developing these materials. And it's a shame that this isn't something that we can do in person because these little material samples are wonderfully tactile, beautiful things, and they're sort of odd to hold in your hand because the cob layer is so dense and the insulating layer is so light um, that they feel almost unbalanced in your hand. So more of this testing, you can see the kind of um, the kind of insulative values that you, you're kind of getting um, the differences between between all the different mixes we've tested. So we're fortunate to have people with PhDs in thermography kind of doing the real heavy lifting in the background in this, um, things that I don't understand. Um, and you can see here on a constant heat behind them, you get very different values of the different mixes. Um, so these have now been kind of optimized and created in recipes, which will be posted online when we create our training materials and they'll be totally free to access worldwide. Um, and this is some of the lovely calibrated equipment in Plymouth University that they use to test it all. And they create kind of samples that are about 250 mil by 250 mil. And they sort of put them in the slot there and the machines do their magic and we get a reading. And the interesting thing is that um, Although the, the U value that we're creating isn't, you know, it's not passive house, it's not super low. The performance gap in buildings means that the predicted numbers you expect from a building, especially uh, a lightweight, maybe um, timber building, they're never quite what you really expect. They never live up to the numbers. Whereas a heavyweight earth monolithic building, they can often actually outperform their numbers. And this is just due to the limitations on the kind of analysis that are run at, you know, a kind of normal level. Um, so we're really optimistic about doing some proper analysis on an as-built example. Um, and the structure has obviously been tested because we're making much thinner walls of the structural cob. They've done huge amounts of testing on optimizing the recipes and the mixes for different soil types in different places. And um, th this is a you know colossal amount of work in the Plymouth researchers' part of view. Um, and this means squashing stuff in huge presses, huge hydraulic presses, um, which would be quite fun thing to, to kind of watch and see. Um, and that includes kind of um, samples and things as big as this. So this would be uh, a, a, a single lift uh, of Caboge, and that's built up in about 600 or 700 millimetres at a time. And then it's given time to dry, at which point the next one is put on almost like kind of slow motion concrete. Um, so there's been a lot of um, a lot of knowledge kind of stolen from the concrete industry, which is a, a nice kind of place to steal from, given that their carbon footprint is pretty colossal. Um, and shuttered cob isn't an unusual thing. We're obviously working within our kind of vernaculars. We're looking at the traditions of cob, but shuttered cob is, is a thing that, um, you know, is tried and true and it, it exists. Um, so we're not just completely making things up. And we are building, we're making things out of Caboge. Um, so this is obviously a computer image of what is being built in France right now. And it's just about topped out in the Caboge. Um, and we're really keen to get the scaffolding down and see what it really looks like. Um, but uh, I've, got, I've got some photos from kind of inside uh, there is so much wiring in this building because it, it is covered. I mean, covered in sensors because we need to understand how it dries, how it moves, what it does, make sure that we've not overlooked anything. So this this must be the one of the most monitored buildings per square meter in existence at the moment. 
Uh, and these are some diagrams of it. You can see that we've experimented with, uh, we've placed a window. So on the left hand side here, our window's pushed all the way out. And the one at the top, the window's in the middle, um, and the one to the right is the door opening. Uh, there's actually a mezzanine level on it, and we're experimenting with the width of the walls. So we're seeing how slim we can make it. We're seeing what happens when we make it thicker. Is it going to affect how long it takes to dry? Because obviously there's water and cob when we need to wait for it to dry. Uh, so this is a, a simple building for us to kind of learn on. Um, and this is just when they were kind of getting going and creating that first lift. So you can see that shuttering there built on top of, unfortunately, a concrete plinth. Not ideal, but it is his the way in France, uh, unfortunately. Um, and you can see the kind of first uh, image there of the Caboge and it's normal mixers, it's normal equipment that people have access to. And that's uh, a kind of pourable slip that goes in with the insulation mix. And it dries to this kind of strong, kind of rigid um, mix once it's once it's done. Um, so we had a, a short film made. If you if you search for Caboge on YouTube, you'll find it. And this is Francois. Um, and he will kind of sort of walk you through uh, what they were doing. Um, and you can see that it was very experimental, it was very hands-on. Everybody was really interested about what was going on and exactly how they were going to make all these details. And this is kind of what a, a finished lift will look like per time. And so the formwork just goes straight onto that, it's strong enough to support it. And then the next lift goes up with any um, openings kind of boxed out with some timber. Uh, and you can see inside here, Unfortunately, the entire outside is covered in scaffolding, and this is on this is uh, you can see the timber at the bottom is the mezzanine level of the um, of this test building, so it's getting there. Um, it's it's further on than this now, but this is the most up to date kind of photos I've got that are in nice sunshine and not kind of grey overcast days. Um, so it's it's a real building it exists, and uh, Hudson are at a point where we're we're um, talking to clients. We're trying to um, see if we can get someone to build. We've got demonstrator projects. We've been in talks with people, so that's kind of ongoing. So we've done a lot of development about how we will use this material to make uh, the most of its amazing properties. So we've actually, in this demonstrator, put a spine wall in because it creates more um, exposed cob on the inside. And as I said, it's got these wonderful qualities of controlling moisture and absorbing VOCs. Um, and we're, we're kind of going on as well. We're trying to think about what we're going to do with Caboge. You know, can we learn from other places? I already said we're trying to tap the mind of the, um, the concrete industry. We're trying to, um, to learn from where we can. And, and mainstream is the goal in this um, because it, uh, although there's, there's some downtime on site because you need to wait for things to dry, in an ideal world, you just have crews kind of moving from one building to another, and it means you can actually build more buildings with less people. Um, so, trying to trying to program that all out, trying to program this in, is one of the one of the places that um, currently Hudson are at, and trying to to make sure we can get this to work as efficiently as possible. Um, and learning from the concrete industry also involves the idea of prefabrication. So. Um, our partners in France um, did a kind of bit of experiment with their test walls and they were curious to see whether they could get them to just sort of stack on top of each other and you know, would it work? Because as I said, the, the samples that I would have handed round, they're much heavier on one side than the other, obviously due to the kind of density. So it means that we had potential concerns about this being stable, you know, is this going to be built the way we imagine? Because obviously it's a, it's a monolithic material Will it work in pieces? Is it going to actually going to actually happen? And and lo and behold, the, the French team it, they said it went together really well. It was very happy. They just sort of positioned it, and it's it's really stable. Um, and that's it's about two point one meters. Um, and you can see obviously having to move it here, it's um it's created indents because it's just earth. So it's you know it's only so strong. It's it's a damageable compressible material compared with something like steel or concrete. But the nice thing is that actually it's earth. So you can just refill it with more earth and earth um, if you could wet the um, the solid part and then um, and add some more of that mix. It just becomes a homogeneous thing. It sticks together really well and that's working with the advantages of the material. So you can see there it got packed out and um, it was nice and strong. It's still standing quite happily kind of under its little shelter. I think, they, I, I don't know if they know what they're going to do with it, to be honest, because it's now this um, 
uh, maybe about 10 tonne lump of wall that we're not sure what to do with. So I think they might try and make a kind of little shelter for some of the workers out there. Um, I don't know if people still smoke quite as much as Francis the last time I went there, hopefully not. Um, and we are doing the same over in the UK at the moment. So this is back in the Plymouth lab with their huge crushing machines. And um, again, this wall was further on, but I, I don't have more up-to-date photos. It's about 2.1 meters as well. We're just doing the final um, the finalizing of that. And you can see the the, um, the formwork here sitting happily on a, a previous lift of Caboge. Um So they're going to build this up below the kind of crushing um, apparatus and then they are going to create two walls so you can see that first wall on the left which will be a completely solid wall it will be completely dried rendered plastered inside like it's a real you know building uh, and then on the other side you can see it's split into three so the center is actually an aperture for a door uh, so we're going to create it like it's a, a two walled room of it um, almost uh, build up to about 2.1 meters which um, because you build earth and cabbage on a little um, stone plinth at the bottom because you need to keep that vulnerable layer of earth at the bottom up from the ground. It's built on that plinth. So that creates about um, the size of a normal ground floor at 2.1 metres. Uh, so it's going to be bridged over, it's going to be loaded and then it's going to be crushed to destruction. I think we might try and live stream that possibly um, when it finally goes. So uh, that's kind of where we're at at the moment, more or less, with Caboge. I think that may be my last one. We um, we do talks quite often as things are progressing. Um, we have social media on Twitter, on um, Instagram, which uh, Instagram especially is full of lovely photos of experiments and lovely earth buildings. Um, and on Facebook as well, um, we occasionally do a live stream and, and things. So follow us there. It's usually me running it. Um, so if you want to get in contact with me beyond this, you can contact me there or you can contact me through Hudson Architects or I'm sure I would get you in touch with me. So I guess I'll just say thank you to Annabelle for having me and hand back to Harriet. Great, Andrew. Thank you very, very much. Um, interesting, I think, for a lot of us just to see some of the process of how um, old building materials but becoming usable again sort of go from... Um, idea through testing to, to being available for mainstream use and then I'm sure lots of architects and others on here that are maybe looking at it as a material that they would hope to include in a project sometime in the future so really interesting sort of brief introduction to to what you're working on um, so we can go now maybe to to questions um, and Andrew maybe if you want to just um, stop your share then we'll get everybody back up on yeah. the screen Perfect. So for anyone um, that would like to ask a question, um, you can put, put your hand up on the Zoom feature and then we'll, we'll see that and we'll get, get you switched on and unmuted so that you can ask. Um, but whilst Jules is doing that, I'll grab one from the chat. So Andrew, a, a quick one from David, um, which is wondering, have, have any of your mixes included lime in any form? Uh, so the, the actual Caboge mixes are purely cob, but lime is a really integral part of building with, uh, with earth. So Obviously, earth is water soluble, and um, so a lime render is a really important thing to have on the outside. And we're at, we've actually got some render test panels um, that have been uh, that have been put on expertly by uh, Ibuki contractors, uh, one of our partners, and they are currently sitting in an exposed site on the Plymouth, Plymouth University uh, campus, just to make sure we can double check. Um, as many lime renders are as compatible as possible with the, the lightweight Caboche mix, because this is something that we've developed ourselves. Although there's nothing new in there, there's nothing unusual, you know, nothing that hasn't been put together before, but it's mm -hmm. always just good to make sure that um, that, that lime render keys properly into it and that uh, it's, you know, the, the lightweight Caboche can support the weight of a lime uh, render as well. But there was never, we never thought about adding lime to the actual mix because the cob, um, the structural cob is strong and resilient um, and the thermal mix will be protected by the lime render anyway. So um, there was never kind of, we, we never explored that, um, that avenue. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, one from, from Robert Adam, which is looking at the longer term thermal response. Um, so he's mentioned that some recent research on longer term thermal performance showed that 
um, has shown on a, on a project he's worked on that over a period of years, the performance improved um, because of increasing thermal stability. So could that be an additional benefit with COB and has that been researched that actually thermal performance is going to improve as the structure ages? Uh, well, I'd be keen to read, uh, read, um, read that, um, really keen. Um, that's, that's something I think we're going to be doing because um, fortunately Plymouth are building a composed building on campus and you know Plymouth University is filled with academics who want to sit and monitor this even beyond the funding of the project uh, so I suspect that give it, give it enough time for the building to be built in Plymouth University, give it enough time for the research to be conducted this will come out but um, unfortunately, obviously, these things just take they take years to do in, in the, the researching. Um, but it's it's not it's something I'm, I'm aware of. Um, but it's not something that we've been able to do yet because obviously we're still at a stage where we're building our very first Caboge buildings. Um, mm. But the research is kind of coming, which you might need to wait a few years. Okay, we can connect you on that. And Robert's corrected me, it wasn't one of his projects, but one that he visited in, in York. So correction on that. Um, another, I know you mentioned, Andrew, towards the beginning that these, that uh, the Caboge can be, can be a very thin wall or sort of surprisingly thin, but you have, what is the, the, the sort of minimum thinness of the, um, the wall pieces that can be done with Caboge? Do you have them uh, About 550 mil, and it goes my camera again. I'm sorry to everyone, my camera keeps on turning itself off. Oh my, um, <laughs> my, computer's, my computer's on its last legs. Um, zoomed out, yeah. My 500 millimeters is about the thinnest one, but um, and that's a 250 mil of the lightweight and a 250 mil of the, um, of the heavyweight cob. Um, oh, how distracting. Um, but we're looking really at, um, at about 600 mil uh, for a full story up and also to be able to build another story on top of that mm -hmm. um, and when we were looking at that we were considering having a thinner build up uh, on the first floor because maybe you know it, it reduces the you know, amount of material and things but the complication that adds to the detailing of the building sort of it sort of wasn't worth it and um, so 500 mils about as thin as, as we could go something like um, if you were building a garden studio maybe Maybe your own private recording studio in your garden. I think it'd be a perfect material for that with its acoustic mm. performance mm -hmm. and a thermal stability. Um, a 500 mil build-up would be uh, enough, and that includes obviously the insulation layer in that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and is that just a question too about drawing time? Um, so, do you think is part of the Caboche project at all sort of thinking ahead to? what might make a developer sort of choose to use or not use the material. Obviously, I know there are all sorts of things like um, the, the actual safety um, and usability of the material that you're looking into, but things like drying out times are things that can slow down a build that developers tend not to like. Is that is that being looked at as part of the... Yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely the kind of elephant in the room of building with earth is that it just takes time to dry out. Um, it's not obviously because it, it, it's water drying out. It's not like a chemical reaction like concrete. So we're kind of at the mercy of of physics. Um, unfortunately, we have looked at ways of force drying. We have looked at um, different ways of kind of uh, creating an artificial environment for it to dry quicker. But unfortunately, what happens is the outer layer of the structural cobble start to crack. And they're not structural cracks, but it would mean that you have to wet it again to sort of to stop that from happening so um yeah drying times are definitely the, the elephant in the room i think if you're able to time a build properly you know because obviously uh earth building even in the the south of england even in the south of france has a has a seasonality to it so you can't build you know in the depths of winter um when it's frozen outside in the earth it, it just doesn't work it doesn't dry um so usually from about now till about October in a good year, you might be able to build an earth. Um, and that drying time is definitely the kind of, it's a bit that we've tried to make that the limitation of the material because it is what it is. We've tried to make sure that you can design what you would like with Caboge. It can respond in the way you want um, aesthetically uh, and it doesn't limit you know, an architect's creativity, but we are unfortunately at the mercy of drying times which um, at the moment we're probably looking about a lift every two and a half to three weeks 
So for a single story, that might be a 12 week program of Caboj. And, you know, that could be um, two weeks of downtime, potentially per lift, if the um, if the program wasn't very, very carefully designed. And I think you're right, any, any contractor, any developer would be looking at that and thinking, hmm, I'm not sure. So that's still something we're looking at. And that's why we started to look at prefab as well. Okay, in fact, you've just anticipated my next question was, do you think, is it, yeah, is a prefab panel, do you think something that, that, that might work with? I think it's quite possible. We're actually applying for more funding to kind of extend this and look more seriously at prefab. Uh, now that we've kind of had a bit of a play about with that, I think we've realised it's got some legs. Um, the interesting thing is, uh, obviously you saw initially there was Clay Lump in Norfolk, there's those uh, houses that are in Garbaldisham in, in Norfolk and um, you know, that's essentially kind of prefab, you know, it's these small elements. We'd be looking at much larger panels like I, um, like I showed the images of. Um, the problem is that Cobb is a monolithic construction, so we need to look about how these panels connect and make sure that these are structurally sound to make sure we get an engineer on board, and make sure things are going to work the way we think they are. And that's part of the reason we need to, we need to look at separate funding for that because it's, um, it's an incredibly important thing, obviously, to get right. We can't have houses falling down. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, well, and I wonder, yeah, how did you actually get into interest with, with, with Earth as a material? So obviously, I know from the studies you did at Glasgow School of Art and then getting into environmental design, but what brought you to, to Earth? And have you found that there are more and more sort of interested universities, departments and, and players in that field in the time you've been working um, working in it. Really. Well, I think, as everyone can tell by my accent, um, I'm from Glasgow and I studied there. There's not a lot of earth education in Glasgow, what with the rain all day, <laughs> every day. So uh, it was actually completely at Hudson that I've learned about earth. Um, I think I was really fortunate to have been brought in a bit because I, I, I think I have a potentially stronger research background than many of my colleagues. I was sort of brought in to this. Um, as we were doing the grant and things and we were being brought into it. So I've essentially learned Earth as I've learned Caboj, which is, it's been great because I'm coming coming in eyes wide open, um, asking the sort of silly questions and I'm sort of getting there with it. And I'm, you know, I've been on this for two years now, so I'm fairly well versed in Earth construction. But at first it meant that the, the kind of cob builders we have on board could sort of educate and I could ask questions that I thought, well, but what about this? Because they have a, incredibly strong knowledge of building the cob, but um, you know, I have a, a more rounded knowledge of other things that I, I've learned about. So I was trying to apply different things that I knew to it. And some some have worked and some haven't, some some aren't applicable. But it's been great to kind of um, learn about such a different material. Um, and it, it's all been done at, at Hudson. So I'm really grateful to Hudson for sort of broadening my eyes. And it also, it's, it's brought me into more natural building materials because a lot of suppliers who will supply things like earth blocks, you know, they supply uh, natural insulations, they supply natural plasters and paints and things that create a much healthier environment. So this process of learning has kind of been brought back into our practice as well. So we're trying to encourage clients to to stay away from kind of horrible latex plastic paints and um, try and create a, a nicer environment for themselves, for their children uh, in the houses that we're building. So. This research is, as much as it's focused on earth building, it's had a really great impact on our architecture as a whole. It's good, yes, no, great. And yeah, well done, Hudson Architects, as you say, and to be working with them and, and getting to learn about this. Um, I wonder, we've had a few questions just come in from Tiffany and from Sam, um, and uh, one from Robert as well. So I wonder if anyone wouldn't mind uh, rather than having these come from me, we might actually un, un, unmute. We could ask um, Tiffany maybe first, as you've asked yours, just to, to, to un, unmute yourself and, and ask, ask your question um, direct. Hi, hello. Um, I'm a student uh, studying architecture and my project's on COP, so I just thought I'd jump on. It's really interesting. Um, I have a couple of questions, but just the first one is the slip you mentioned. Is it purely clay and water, or do you add other things? I saw that it was really reddish, but I'm not sure yeah. if that's just because. Yeah, it, it is a, it's a kind of normal, it's a clay slip um, that they make up 
I, uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, I have not been able to go and actually play in the mud. So I kind of, I understand how the mixes um, go together. I don't have complete recipes for them, though. Um, but it, it's just a normal, that is just a normal clay slip that's added to, I think, the French team were using flax uh, on that build. Um, and I think um, for the Plymouth test laws, we've actually had to import flax from France. So, you mm, know slightly questionable environmental credentials there, but trying to find the correct material in the UK has been a surprising difficulty. But yeah, the the slip that's made up is, is just a normal place slip. Uh, and that, you're right, that's why it's got a different colour. And I was just wondering with that, did you consider, or um, has there been consideration of adding like, for example, chalk? Because for example, Wishart is made with chalk as well. And how does that uh, react like to the whole thing? Uh, none of the areas we've been at have had chalk-rich soil, so it's not something we've looked at yet. Um, there is a paper that's came out from Caboge One looking at uh, examining different build-ups, but I don't think they had access to a chalk soil at the time, so they weren't able to do that. Um, I probably, uh, If I had that question, I'd probably ask one of my colleagues, which I, I may pass it on to them, actually. Um, mm -hmm. so I think it's an interesting one um, because they are they are the cop builders. And... Yeah, because just from what I've learned, um, traditionally Wishard can be already thinner because of somehow this chalk is stronger or something. So that just came to mind. Um, but you mentioned um, is that research and paper available? The one that you just mentioned. I don't know if it's been published yet, but I will see if I can share it with you. Um, if you if you want to contact me. After this, I'll, I'll see if I can if I'm allowed to share it because it's it's written by Plymouth University. Okay. Um. So I I would hope they'd have an amended one at least to give it to students. Amazing, and so that's just through Facebook as well, or? Uh, yeah, you can contact me through any of the Hudson Architects social media, uh, or okay. you can contact me through Intel if you like, or um my email email address, which I'm happy to give it, is just Andrew at Hudson Architects. That's what you So just anyway, forward. If and if it is, it's, it's nice. There's no other answers there at the moment. If it is shareable, Andrew, then then maybe yes. Then we can send it round to all the participants on the talk. As I'm yeah, sure yeah, I think it's really good. interested in seeing that. It'd be great. Okay, excellent. Thanks. What, 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 sorry, what, what university are you at, Tiffany? Uh, I study at the AA, the Architectural Association in London. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Right, um, One last question. Yeah, yeah, course, the yeah. foundation. You mentioned that they they did the test in France on concrete. Um, and that it was unusual. Is so. What would a normal kind of proposed one, or is is concrete the kind of like plan for the cobbler at the moment? Sorry, I sort of I missed the start of that. Oh, sorry. I'm just asking about the foundation. Um, oh is yeah. It concrete at the moment, um, like what you're looking into, or like stone, or yeah. In the UK side, it is concrete, um, just because that's what we have access to, and that's what we can get an engineer to agree to. Right, At the okay. moment, the Plymouth uh, prototype on campus, it's uh, it's made up ground, uh, which has been kind of backfilled over the years. So the engineers are pretty concerned about building on it, and they, they are um, conscious of having a really strong foundation. So we're sort of limited to concrete there. Uh, in France, so we use uh, pumice stone on some of the foundations. Okay. Um, so that's something that we're beginning to look into at the moment. Um, I did get a link to somewhere selling just Pumice Foundation blocks uh, from our French team. So if I find that and if I'm in contact with you, um, mm -hmm. okay. please by all means ask that and I'll, uh, I'll share that with you as well. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, You're everyone. Cool. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, one uh, from uh, from Sam, Andrew, just to put to you. So he's uh, in terms of drawing times, just wondering uh, if you had uh, looked into the clay daven method of building with cob, um, which is putting a layer of straw or fiber between each lift, which seems maybe to allow the buildings to be built quickly without the need for, for downtime. Yes, I think um, there was talk of experimenting with that in the Plymouth walls, but because they're going to crush them for structural testing, um, the academics were worried that it may affect the numbers on that. Um, I would I would hope that it wouldn't, but we they weren't 100% sure and didn't want to compromise what is months of work. 
to get these numbers for um, building control. Mm. So it, it just meant that we, we didn't have the experimentation of doing that. Um, I think the French team have looked at that a little bit. Um, I think it may be something that they're going to do during this summer, actually just as a separate physical test wall next to it. So it's, it's um, we're, as I say, we're fortunate to have access to really experienced core builders. Um, but it's, it's about trying to make sure we can not just experiment as much as possible, but get successful experiments. So th there's some we have to play a bit safe, unfortunately, just to make sure we can actually build a building. Makes sense, yeah. And then doing the experiments to prove for, for developers, for example, that the, the dry time doesn't need to be a deterrent can come after proving safety. Um, two interesting, uh, just quick ones from uh, from Robert Adams. So one being with this as a material, does it does, does the material itself suggest um, organic forms? For example, if you can can you have square corners or all, or or are all corners naturally going to have a bit of the bit of the curve to them? Uh, no, square corners are absolutely possible. Um, in fact, the, uh, the the ambition of the material is to not dictate the architecture. It could be completely yeah. curved forms, but the Plymouth prototype, um, you know, it's just a single room with a mono pitch roof that's a, a bit bigger than the um, the one in France. Uh, but it has one of the corners um, squared off. Uh, it has one of the, sorry, it's three square corners and one's been rounded off. So it's about a two metre um, diameter curve on one of the corners. So mm -hmm. we're kind of experimenting with that again a bit. Um, and obviously the formwork you saw, um, it's actually really good metal formwork. But um, the format can be timber. It can be, you know, what, whatever someone would have access to. And I think to create these curved walls, all you need to do is sort of create a bit of curved formwork, which if you've got access to a joiner is no, no problem at all. Yep, makes sense. I see it's the material, not the limitation of the curve could be there, but as you say, different, yeah, different formwork required. Um, are there any other sort of structural? So for example, with, with depth of eave, um, to keep moisture sort of well away from the from the walls. If there are other, does the material sort of impact on other elements of the design, um, such as eave depth, for example? Uh, yeah, so the vernacular for, for earth buildings is usually kind of a, a plinth to build on and large overhangs at the eaves, and that's the, the a good set of boots and a, a good hat for the building to sort of keep it dry. Um, we're doing experiments on the render to make sure that it's really, really robust so that if a client or the vernacular dictated of you know planning authority um they could have short overhangs um and um the, the plinth material can be sort of faced with um whatever masonry you like obviously it's in the ground so essentially uh, within the uk it more or less has to be masonry um but the actual um the actual roof design should be fairly free it could have much smaller overhangs. Um, we're doing a, a set of kind of standard details for the Caboj training manuals and literature, which will be made available come the end of the, um, oh, before the end of the, the project. Um, and I've drawn up several short overhangs and we, we just sort of discussed them with our technical team in Caboj. Um, and we sort of came to the conclusion that if, you know, if the render, as long as the top of the render where it kind of ends, is well protected. There's no reason why a part of the line render that's 500 mil away from the edge or 1500 mil away from the edge wouldn't form the same. Um, so we, we're feeling kind of okay about the the material not dictating the roof shape or the form of the building. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and a note from Robert too, just saying in in Hampshire, I think chalk chalk cob um, in that area seems to be widely widely used. So nice that, as you say, there's there's history of these materials in in the UK across the UK in their different forms. Yes, yeah, really. It's, I I find it really interesting to learn about how different earth building is across the UK, and then to think about how similar all the new houses that get built in new around the UK are. It's kind of I think a return to more local traditions that take advantage of local conditions would be advantageous to stop living in the same houses no matter where we live. But that's a, right. that's a discussion for another, another yes. one. 
you know, to say, but the standards that you, you I mean, your this research um, presumably clearing the way for multiple different regional variations of something that's been proved to be usable. Is that the yeah. idea? Than, the, the, yeah. I mean, the, the idea is that um, in an ideal world, uh, even a self builder could get a plot, get planning permission, dig a hole, put a foundation in, use the stuff he dig the hole, you know, use what he dug out of that hole to build his building and then render it for a refund. So okay. no matter, well, it'd be interesting. So even if two buildings looked completely identical, the core of that building would be, you know, inherently local, which I, I think is a kind of nice thing to, to think about, even if, even if they did look the same, which hopefully they wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. So great. Um, I will hand to. I think Jules has a has a question about um, upcoming work, and then and then probably time to wrap up. But if there are any other hands that pop up or questions that come into the chat, in the meantime, we'll come to those. Jules, hand to you. Thank you, Harriet. Sorry, that was a badly timed cough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have I have one question, Andrew. Yes, do you have any upcoming projects in the pipeline, perhaps with sort of independent clients at all in the next? Yeah, yeah, so um, at Hudson, I, I, it's not in the um, the slides yet because we're kind of not quite there. But um, Hudson are in Scotland. So we put in a pre-app for a, a caboose building, a, a real live building for people to live in and actually um, call their home with uh, East Suffolk Council. So it's in Beckles, um, it's a gap site. And interestingly, it's uh, a sort of row of bungalows and we're needing to almost mimic the, the bungalow that's there. So all the work that we've put in to have the material not be, uh, the material not dictate the aesthetic sort of paid off on this because it means that we can go in and create this um, really interesting building of kind of interesting architectural merit that doesn't have to, you know, um, stand out and upset everyone in the local street. Um, and I think it, it really, it's actually a really kind of important earth building and the kind of scheme of, of where it is continuing that tradition of construction um, in a slightly different way. So yeah, I think we're kind of maybe nearly almost there of having a proper building getting built. So um, hopefully if you follow us on those socials, you can sort of keep up to date with that. I think we um, hopefully we'll get on site and once we are on site, we're planning to do a lot of information about the, the build on that. Um, even kind of Facebook Live stuff with me just blogging about the building site to kind of explain dif you know, differences and difficulties and triumphs that we're having. So hopefully that will be of um, interest and hopefully we'll get on site. Absolutely. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, well, I'm sure Intval will be resharing as much as we can. And um, thanks to everyone for sticking with us. It's been a really, really, really interesting talk, Andrew. So thank you. Um, You've, you've given your contact details out. I'll also circulate the link to the website um, to all participants. So have a, have a great rest of the day, everyone. And um, I think that's all from me and Harriet. Good, yeah. yes, no, thanks, Andrew. And thanks everyone for joining, very good. Yeah, just thank you guys for having me and thanks for everyone watching here in, on Facebook and maybe yeah. on YouTube once it goes on there, I guess. Even um, on YouTube, yep, yeah. no, it, it, will, it will do that. Um, and we'll pause this is useful chat we're having right now, Andrews. It gives you time to look in the chat to read all the thanks that are coming in um, yep. from people. <laughs> Good session. Great.